Mike Sinkara. Uh, Mike Sinkara, I'm actually a reporting radiographer. Today, you know, uh, we're going to sort of present this um, presentation, you know, talking about, you know, approaches to arthropathies. Arthropathies, you know, uh, can also be called, you know, arthritis or different types of arthritis. There are so many types of arthritis which possibly we're going to talk about. And uh, uh, to begin with, you know, this presentation is going to look at, uh, you know, uh, arthropathies and their features, why they appear and how we can differentiate them from uh, one another. Okay. To begin with, on the uh, on the left, but you know, column there, we we have a condition. We have the common sites, you know, of involvement, and then we also have the radiographic features that you need to be looking at to differentiate or to come up with a, a an educated, you know, uh, guess as to what you're looking at. The first one is primary osteoarthritis. Osteoarthritis tend to actually involve the hands and large joints like the, the, the hips, you know, the, the knees. It also, you know, uh, can be found in the spine as well. If you are looking at the hand x-rays, you know, we, we tend to do both hands really to compare the left and the right side, you know. So basically, we, we, when I was a, a student, we, 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 we were taught to do DP hands and you know at the ball catcher's positions, which are the external obliques of both hands. So the DP is going to show you you know swelling around the distal interphalangeal joints and the proximal interphalangeal joints. So the, these are called the Herbertans nodes and the Butcher's nodes. So these are clinical findings that the, the doctors looking after the patient is, are going to see as and when they you know examine the patient. So they will be looking at the hands. And then they definitely will see those kind of swellings. Women tend to have uh, more of osteoarthritis than men. We don't know why. And uh, one of the radiological features that you are going to be looking at is joint space narrowing. Uh, in fact, I must be quick here to mention that you know, the joint space narrowing is actually non-uniform joint space narrowing. That's very important. Because in rheumatoid arthritis, rheumatoid arthritis gives us a uniform joint space narrowing, whilst osteoarthritis gives us a non-uniform joint space narrowing. The other feature that you're going to be looking out for is subchondral sclerosis. I'm going to explain this you know, as we you know, unfold the, the topic. And then we're going to look at you know, subchondral cysts. You know, some, some books will call uh, uh, Subchondral cysts are the geodes or, um, or intraosseous cysts. And then there is new bone production called the osteophytes. So the, the four main features that you see in osteoarthritis are non-uniform joint space narrowing. You are going to see subchondral sclerosis. You are going to see subchondral cysts or geodes and you know, osteophytosis as it were. In the spine, you are going to see, you know, um, all these, you know, things that I've spoken about, and you are going to see uh, disc uh, space narrowing, and uh, sometimes patients may present with severe pain, and you are going to see, you know, the destruction of the disc space with the uh, production of nitrogen which you know uh, people call vacuum phenomena. So these things are going to see them in the spine. I, I, will sh I, will, I will show them to you. Then the other bit is erosive arthritis. Again, it is quite predominant in the hands where you see you know, um, uh, erosions uh, that are called central or marginal, uh, uh, with marginal osteophytes. They tend to see, uh, you, you tend to see these in the uh, proximal interphalangeal joints and the distal interphalangeal joints. The other feature that you look at, uh, type of arthritis you look at, is the rheumatoid arthritis. Again, rheumatoid arthritis in the hands, large joints, and all all of these are different types of you know 
uh, arthropathies that you know possibly are going to look at. And uh, the next one uh, will be CPPD, HDD, hematochromatosis, all these are different types of arthritis that you know possibly are uh, out there. Some of these are not common, but the majority of the ones on page one are quite common. And we're going to spend a bit of time talking about these ones on page one. So talking about osteoarthritis, you know, we, we've got uh, uh, the, the, the first feature that I spoke about, non-uniform joint space narrowing. It's very, very important as you look at it, this X-ray here, it, it is actually giving us, you know, um, non-uniform joint space narrowing here. It's a bit wider here, a bit narrower on the other side here. So this is a feature of osteoarthritis, non-uniform joint space narrowing. Okay, we can also see that you know, the, the other you know, fingers, they, they do have uh, non-uniform uh, non joint space narrowing, predominantly involving the distal interphalangeal joints. That's, another, that's, that's a feature of osteoarthritis, okay? The other side that you can look out for osteoarthritis, like I said, would be the large joints, like in this case, the, the knee. What we have here is non-uniform joint space narrowing. The medial tibial femoral joint line here is actually a bit narrower as compared to the lateral tibial femoral joint space here. Notice also that you know, the, the articular surfaces you know, in, in the medial compartment here, this is more white tissue here. This is what is called subchondral sclerosis. So this bone here is actually dying or it is actually you know, dead as it were, because we can see that you know, it is a, a vascularized as it were. Then the other feature we can see here are the osteophytes. So osteophytes, sub, uh, uh, subarticular sclerosis, and non-uniform joint space narrowing, these are features of osteoarthritis. If you look closely in this, this knee here, there is more or less like a, a genuine varus deformity. It's more or less like this bowing deformity of the knee here. This is what is called genuine virus deformity. In some patients, you know, this is quite common. You can see, you know, um, some kind of angulation, either inwards or outwards. If it is outwards, it will be what is called genuine valgus deformity. But in this case here, we have a non-uniform joint space narrowing involving the medial compartment, subparticular sclerosis, and marginal osteophytes, you know, in the in, in the both in the medial and lateral uh, joint compartments with a genuine virus uh, deformity. Classic example of osteoarthritis. Okay, so we can see that there is actually non uniform joint space narrowing in that joint. Okay, look at that again non uniform joint space narrowing, and then we can also see that you know, there's actually subchondral sclerosis. Uh, uh, associated with that joint you know, destruction. These are called the osteophytes uh, because as and when the bone is getting uh, uh, destroyed, the joint space is getting destroyed, uh, the, the, bone be the joint becomes unstable. Now for the joint itself to find its stability, the body or the bones try to heal themselves by actually producing more bone. So the more bone that is being produced here in osteoarthritis, it is trying to make the joint become more stable. So these pointed bits are called the osteophytes. They are quite classic you know, features of osteoarthritis. The other feature, like I said, will be subchondral cysts or some books will call them geodes. We can see some kind of lucencies around here, you know, in the in the in the in the uh, capitate here, there is that lucency there. There are some lucencies actually in the triquitral here. Another lucency to the distal aspect of the ulna. So these are called geodes or subchondral cysts. So what, what causes you know, these subchondral cysts? It, the, the, we know that it, many of the joints are actually synovial in nature. And then in, in, in the synovial sac, we do have synovial fluid. So as and when there is degeneration of the bone, 
there is too much pressure created in the joint space itself. So the uh, cartilages are destroyed and because of the increased pressure in the joint, the, the fluid tends to actually seep into the bone, creating these islands called the subchondrosis. So you see these actually in osteoarthritis, like in this case here. Okay. So distribution of osteoarthritis, usually it, it, it involves the interphalangeal joints and uh, the first couple metacarpal and the scaphoid trapezoid trapezoid joints. So this is the distribution of uh, osteoarthritis in the hands. It's very, very rare that you know, you know, it will involve the metacarpal phalangeal joints. It can, but it is very, very rare. But the, these are the common signs that you tend to see osteoarthritis, usually the uh, interphalangeal joints, the first couple, metacarpal, and the scaphoid trapezoid, trapezoid joints. You would also see osteoarthritis in the radio carpal joints. You also see them actually to the distal interphalangeal the distal radio ulna joint. This is another site or the, uh, uh, the other site where you can find osteoarthritis in the hips. So in this case here, what we have is that there is actually joint space narrowing. We can't delineate the femoral joint on the right side. And uh, on the left side here too, we do have features of moderate to severe osteoarthritic changes uh, characterized by joint space narrowing. We can see subchondral sclerosis and a tiny acetabular osteophyte, you know, on the, on the left hip. On the right side here, we do have significant joint space narrowing. We can see, you know, sub subchondral cysts, you know, involving the acetabular roof and the femoral head. Now, notice also that we do have the whitish appearance here these are, this is what is called subchondral sclerosis. If you notice again here, this patient, uh, the, 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 the articular surface of the femoral head on the right side has collapsed. So there is a flattening of the uh, femoral head on the right side, which is actually a, a vascular necrosis. So one of the complications, late complications of um, uh, osteoarthritis, if it is really severe, is a vascular necrosis. So all this bit here is dead. So this patient obviously, you know, would need a new hip because of se uh, severe osteoarthritic changes, which has led to a vascular necrosis. Remember those features I was talking about that constitute osteoarthritis, things like joint space narrowing, subarticular sclerosis, subchondrosis, and osteophytosis as well. Okay, so those are the features that you know you are able to see. Like I, I, I said, okay, there is joint space, you know, uh, um, asymmetric joint space narrowing. There is a there is a chap called um, um, Clyde 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 Helms. Clyde Helms is one of the top radiologists, I think is, is American. So he he suggested that, you know, if you're looking at osteoarthritis in the hips, there is, you know, a superior migration of the femoral head, you know, in the uh, superior you know, migration. So the joint space tend to actually uh, narrow in the superlateral aspect of the uh, femoral setup femoral acetabular joint, as it, as, as it were. And for rheumatoid arthritis, there is axial migration of the femoral head. So in rheumatoid arthritis, it goes, you know, exactly towards the spine. But for osteoarthritis, there is superlateral migration of the femoral head, like in this case. We are back to this one again. We spoke about you know that X-ray, and it sort of defines what we were we were looking at. Okay. <clears throat> Distribution of osteoarthritis in the hands usually it would be uh, unilateral. 
both hands may or may not be in, you know in, in involved but in rheumatoid arthritis it is symmetric what is happening on the left side is actually usually happening on the other side as well so that this is how you are going to start differentiating these uh, abnormalities osteoarthritis usually starts in the hands involving the uh, interphalangeal joints the first couple metacarpal joints and the scaphoid trapezoid, trapezoid joint, and usually it will be in unilateral. Okay. Erosive arthritis is quite common as well uh, in mid, uh, mid, mid, middle aged women. It's, I don't know why, but it's actually common in those, you know, uh, that, that age group. So in this case here, uh, erosions tend to affect the uh, in, interphalangeal joints usually. So you can see here that, you know, this joint here, there are central erosions here, okay? These are central erosions. Look at the erosions involving this joint here, okay? There are erosions involving this joint here. So this is erosive osteoarthritis. There are central erosions with the osteophytes being formed, okay? Osteophytes are being formed here and we have central erosions. Rheumatoid arthritis does not have central erosions, but it will have what is called bare area, bare area erosions, or non-marginal erosions, or erosions that affect, that do not affect the particular surface. So uh, for rheumatoid arthritis, you'll have erosions in those areas like that, but not these central erosions. So these are quite common in erosive arthritis, which is uh, uh, um, uh, common in these joints, like as it were. Okay. This is rheumatoid arthritis. In rheumatoid arthritis, what we tend to see, are uh, it tends to involve usually the metacarpophalangeal joints. And to some extent, it will also involve the proximal interphalangeal joints. Rheumatoid arthritis does not, does not, it can, but usually it does not involve the distal interphalangeal joints. So if a clinician is looking for uh, radiological features of uh, rheumatoid arthritis, they should not even waste time looking, look, searching for rheumatoid arthritis in the distal interphalangeal joints because it rarely, rarely, you know, involves these joints. Usually, women tend to actually, you know, get rheumatoid arthritis and it will involve the proximal interphalangeal joints, including the metacarpophalangeal joints and the carpus. So it will involve the carpus here. It will involve the metacarpophalangeal joints and it will also involve the proximal interphalangeal joints. What features are we going to be looking out for? If you notice here that you know in osteoarthritis, the bone density is maintained. So there is no concern for you know, osteoporosis or bone demineralization in osteoarthritis. The bones maintain their uh, natural um, density. But for rheumatoid arthritis, there is a component of periarticular you know, osteopenia or generalized osteopenia of the bones, like in this case. So we can see that there is actually loss of density you know, a, uh, of the bones. There is a uh, could be complete subluxations uh, or dislocations or subluxations of the metacarpophalangeal joints. You also see soft tissue swelling around the metacarpophalangeal joints. This is why when people are, uh, want to rule out uh, rheumatoid arthritis, it is very, very important that you know, we actually do a proper DP projection of both hands and the ball catches position. What are you looking for? You're looking for uh, soft tissue, um, uh, or people call them panas formation. You're going to look, be looking for features of synovitis, actually, you know, in these joints. You're going to be looking for subluxations, 
they are going to be looking at for uh, periarticular erosions, osteopenia, like I said. Notice also that you know in rheumatoid arthritis, because of panas, which uh, gives rise to um, 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 ligamentous laxity, there is widening of the scaphalonate ligament here. So this diastasis of the lunate and the, the, the scaphalonate interval here is quite common in patients with rheumatoid arthritis. This is the reason why, I'll come back to that later, uh, when, when the, 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 the clinicians uh, are asking for the cervical spine uh, to be done in flexion and extension views, they are looking for you know, features that could suggest ligamentous laxity in the, in the neck. So this is rheumatoid arthritis, that's how it, it, it looks like. So notice that there is actually juxtaticular uh, osteopenia. Sorry about that. Juxtaticular osteopenia. Look at the bone variations in bone density. Okay. So this is the juxtaticular osteoporosis or osteopenia here. This is the feature that you see in um, rheumatoid arthritis. Notice also that there is actually diastasis of the scaphalonate interval here, secondary to panas formation, which has led to ligamentous laxity in this patient. Okay. Okay. So we can see that, you know, uh, in rheumatoid arthritis, because of the panas formation and the ligamentous laxity, like I said, we have ligamentous laxity in the, uh, in the wrist, and also the gamentous laxity holding the, 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 the bone, the, the joint in place. So you have ulnar deviation of the uh, metacarpophalangeal joints. So all these joints are actually destroyed because of um, uh, uh, panas in the, in, the, in the joint. So in this case here, we, we have a, a joint you know, whereby the uh, the inflammation would, would occur in a joint. We have the bone, we have got the cartilage, we have got the synovial fluid in there, everything is fine, okay? And the synovial fluid is just okay, there is absolutely, you know, nothing happening there. But once the synovium is, you know, thick and there is a panas formation, this joint becomes unstable and it is actually stretched, okay? Uh, some people may have, you know, um, uh, treatment, you know, and uh, uh, the, the stretched, you know, um, 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 uh, capsule, you know, may not go back to its natural position. So in this case here, yeah, the joint becomes weak and there is actually, you know, subluxation of the joint itself. Remember what I said, um, the, this panas formation is quite, uh, you know, uh, dangerous to the joint because it's going to make the joint become unstable and then there, there's going to be, you know, subluxations of the, of the joint itself. So what are the uh, features that we see in rheumatoid arthritis? We say in rheumatoid arthritis, you are going to have osteopenia. You are going to have um, um, ligamentous laxity or ulnar deviations. You are going to see, you know, uh, uh, um, bone density is going to be reduced. And then you're going to have what they call a botonia deformity and swan, swan neck deformities as well. Okay, a swan neck deformity is whereby there is a um, hyper, 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 extent, flex, hyper, swan neck deformity is hyper, flex, hyper extension of the proximal interphalangeal joint and the hyperflexion of the distal interphalangeal joint. And the bottom ear deformity is flexion, is flexion of the proximal interphalangeal joint and extension of the proximal interphal distal interphalangeal joint. So the fingers are going to appear something like that. So this is what is called the bottom ear deformity and the reverse is called the swan neck deformities. 
So when you are reporting or assessing a patient with rheumatoid arthritis, you are going to be looking out for all these things that I'm talking about. Otherwise, the patient is going to be put on a different uh, treatment pathway. Again, OA, uniform joint space narrowing, osteophyte formation, subchondrosis, and then you're going to have um, 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 osteophytes, as it were, and the bone density is maintained. In the erosive OA, you are going to have what is called the central erosions or marginal erosions. In rheumatoid arthritis, there is demineralization of the bones. You are going to have uh, botonia deformities, swollen neck deformities. You are going to have ulnar deviations or subluxations or dislocations at the metacarpophalangeal joints. You're going to have you know, widening of the scaphalonic interval. You're going to have uh, cystic formation as well, but rheumatoid does not produce osteophytes. Okay. So if the, like I, I spoke about this one here. So you, when you have the panas you know, uh, for, formed in the joint, it's going to you know, start destroying the cartilage so the cartilage is going to be you know, uh, uh, destroyed and the, you know, the joint space is going to start narrowing. And in inst some instances, there's going to be ankylosis of the joint itself. But this panas tends now to start attacking the bare area erosions where there is no cartilage. So the bone is going to start you know, being destroyed in, in, in the areas where there is no cartilage. So those areas you know, will be destroyed by the panas itself and there's going to be erosions in those areas. Notice here that there is actually a bare area erosion here. This is not the articular surface. You know, so, um, so when you do the DP, proper DPs, you are going to see those erosions when you do the ball catches position, you are going to see those kind of erosions as well. This is as a result of panas formation. Okay. We can see this patient, both hands have been x-rayed. And then we see that what is happening on the left side is actually happening on the right side. So it is more symmetrical. Um, and this is why people tend to do this, you know, for comparison's sake. Okay, notice that you know we have uh, um, uh, ligamentous laxity here at the scaphalonic interval. This is actually happening on the same side as well. What is happening on the left is happening on the right. So rheumatoid tends to be symmetrical and bilateral, you know, in, in distribution. So never do one hand for for rheumatoid. So do, 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 do both. And this is actually the distribution of uh, rheumatoid arthritis involving the proximal interphalangeal joints, metacarpophalangeal joints, and the carpa and the carpus. I must mention here that you know, the, the feet can also have uh, rheumatoid arthritis. But predominantly, it involves the head of the fourth and the fifth metatarsals. If you are doing the feet, the DP and the, the obliques in, in the feet, it will involve the fourth and the fifth metatarsal phalangeal, jo uh, metatarsal phalangeal joints, actually. I don't know why, but you know, you, if you are doing the Pit x-rays, you should be looking out for rheumatoid arthritis in, the, in those joints. In the hips, we can see that, you know, there is what is called acetabular protrusio. So there is exio migration of the, fema, of the femoral head towards the, the sacrum, you know. Uh, this is what is called um, acetabular protrusio here. If you notice that, you know, there is, this is the ileoisio line so the, 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 the acetabular roof should not go beyond this line. But in a patient with rheumatoid arthritis, 
there is actually erosion of this acetabular roof, and then it pushes the the head of the uh, femur pushes the, the 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 roof of the acetabulum towards the spine, and this is what is called acetabular protrusion, and the joint space narrowing of the hip joint is actually symmetrical and it is you know, concentric, meaning therefore that there is equal joint space narrowing. What is happening on the left side is also happening on the right side. I said rheumatoid arthritis tend to actually involve both you know, uh, similar joints in, in an equal measure. Okay, so that is actually rheumatoid arthritis. Okay, look at that. Oh, sorry about that. Look at the foot x-ray here. We have the uh, non-marginal um, um, uh, erosion here involving the head of the fourth metatarsal. I don't know why rheumatoid arthritis you know, involves the fourth, the fifth, but osteoarthritis tends to involve the first metatarsal phalangeal joint. Okay. So we'll give you this one. I can, uh, we, we spoke about that. And these are the sites that you may find in rheumatoid arthritis, you know, uh, quite common in the, in, the, in the cervical spine, in the shoulders, elbows, you know, hips, knees, feet, hands, you know, you can find, you know, uh, osteo, um, rheumatoid arthritis there. Sometimes, you know, the uh, uh, clinicians might ask for um, uh, more or less like a skeleton, it's not a skeletal survey really, but they may ask for different types of uh, x-rays, you know, to rule out rheumatoid arthritis, then they will, they will list these, you know, um, um, uh, anatomical sites looking for rheumatoid arthritis because these are the common ones, you know, where you can find, you know, rheumatoid arthritis, as it were. The next thing that we're going to look out for is the psoriatic arthritis. Psoriatic arthritis, basically, you know, you, you may, first of all, um, the clinician obviously will have, will have established that this patient has got skin uh, psoriatic arthritis. You know, the skin will have had that, and then the, the people will examine their patient's nails. The nails will actually give them a clinical picture that somebody has got psoriatic arthritis. Now, psoriatic arthritis can also manifest you know, radiographically in different parts of the, uh, of the body. So in this case here, this is a patient who has got, uh, you know, what we call a sausage digit. Look at the soft tissues of the index finger and the middle finger here, including also, let me say all the fingers here, but largely, largely, you may not have these other fingers, you know, involved with what we call the sausage digit. The sausage digit, you know, is more like the digit looks like a sausage, really. So there is actually soft tissue swelling of the index finger usually. Um, so it will have, first of all, soft tissue swelling of the index finger, and you may also have what is called the acroosteolysis or loss of the terminal tufts of the distal phalanges of all you know, um, um, fingers. You may also have what is called the pencil in cup um, uh, erosions. The more or less like there's actually penciling of the, uh, of, of, look at this one here. There is actually penciling, penciling of the, uh, the head of the uh, proximal phalanx of the, of the thumb and then Notice also here, this is more or less like there's a cup being formed here. So there is pencil in cup, you know, erosions, you know, that you may see in all these digits. Okay. So all these features are pointing towards psoriatic arthritis. So there is a sausage, sausage digit and the pencil in cup formation, you know, of the digits concerned. So these will be the features of, uh, uh, 
uh, uh, psoriatic arthritis. Uh, the sausage digit, some books will call it the fusiform soft tissue um, uh, swelling of the um, index or whatever fingers and stuff. Look at this. There is a sausage, oh, come on. There is actually a sausage digit you know, of the index finger here, soft tissue swelling, you know, but we, we, we have got no features of a pencil in cap deformity or erosions. If a patient has been clinically diagnosed to have psoriatic arthritis, when you see such a picture as this one here, you are going to actually be confident to say that, no, there is a sausage digit involving the, um, the index finger with periostitis. If you notice, I think one of my earlier um, um, presentation I made on MSK, I spoke about um, periosteal reaction. One of the uh, things that you see in psoriatic arthritis is periostitis or periosteal reaction, which we can see involving the shaft of the proximal phalanx of the index finger. So there is periostitis here, which is common in psoriatic arthritis. We can also see a sausage digit with no erosions at all. These features, I would be very confident to actually call this one as psoriatic arthritis because of those features we are seeing there. Okay, that is periostitis being formed. Okay. So these are these are the features that you know you, you might be looking out for, you know, in psoriatic arthritis. It's quite common also on the uh, plantar aspect of the calcaneus. So you will see it over there. You will see you know roughening of the um, the attachment of the plantar fascia on the dorsal aspect of the calcaneus. You will be able to see it over there. You will also be able to see that on the attachment of the Achilles tendon. So there will be those kind of erosions over there too. So uh, when the clinician has asked for these kind of x-rays, you must be able to sort of do them. And if you are interested in you know, image reporting, these are some of the things that are going to be looking out for in those areas, okay. Okay, that is the, uh, um, pencil and cap formation or erosions, we can see that is, there is actually penciling of, of that joint. So I don't know why this thing is doing this. There is actually penciling, penciling of this joint, pencil and cap formation here. All these are features of uh, psoriatic arthritis. Okay, there we go. Another feature is what they call the mouse ear erosions. So there are, there are these kind of erosions where it was like, a, they are called the mouse ear erosions. Okay, so this is what they mean by mouse, whatever, you know, erosions with a, with a sausage digit, you know, of that uh, um, digit. That's psoriatic arthritis, that's how, it, that's how it looks like. And that is psoriatic arthritis, there is acroosteolysis, there is loss or erosion of the terminal tuft of um, uh, the terminal tuft of the of the of the digit that is concerned, you know, with the uh, psoriatic arthritis. That is acroosteolysis, common in psoriatic arthritis. Okay. Distribution of psoriatic arthritis is like that. So once you are trying to sort of rule out or um, you know, diagnose you know, psoriatic arthritis, that is the distribution of, uh, of, uh, of psoriatic arthritis. Notice also that you know, um, periostitis can also be there as well, okay. Okay, distribution, that's all distribution of uh, psoriatic arthritis. These are the other sites we can see that you know, there is actually ankylosis of that joint, which is quite common also in psoriatic arthritis. Look at the 
the, the mount here, kind of erosions over here. There is pencil in cap formation here, pencil in cap formation here. There's maybe pencil in cap formation here in a patient with this heart arthritis. Notice the soft tissue swelling, you know, of these, you know, uh, uh, digits. Okay. This is another sign, uh, uh, another site where you can actually find, you know, uh, psoriatic arthritis. Psoriatic arthritis, usually you find it like, you know, these are parasyndesmophytes. These are chunky, you know, um, parasyndesmophytes arising from the body of the vertebra. So they're quite thick or chunky like, like, like this. So they tend to be quite unilateral, uh, unilateral. So basically it is over here, but it has preserved the other bit here. It is over here. But I think this is just projectional. So it may not be uh, bilateral. So it clinical pic radiological picture, you know, entails that you know, you're going to have one over here, the other one over there. So these are very chunky parasymmetrophytes arising from the body of the vertebra itself. Psoriatic arthritis also can also have uh, one of the sacroiliac joints, you know, involved. You can have sacroiliitis or ankylosis of one sacroiliac joint, not two. If you have got sacroiliitis involving two uh, SI joints, then you are not looking at osteoarthritis. You're not looking at, you know, uh, psoriatic arthritis. You would be looking for either uh, ankylosing spondylitis or inflammatory bowel disease. Uh, psoriatic arthritis and uh, uh, Foretia's disease or re reactive arthritis, they tend to involve only one sacroiliac joint. So in this case here, we have, you know, sacroiliitis largely involving the, the right side here because we, we can't even see it over here. But on the left side here, we can barely see the sacroiliac joint here. So this is the skeletal or um, uh, exio. Uh, manifestation of psoriatic arthritis in the in the spine. That's the distribution. The radiological features that you see will be on the left, and that's the distribution of uh, psoriatic arthritis. Okay, we can tell that now this is soft tissue swelling around here, pencil in cap deformity. We see that this is actually could be you know psoriatic arthritis. This is rheumatoid arthritis. Uh, sorry. This is actually osteoarthritis, non-uniform joint space narrowing, subarticular sclerosis, osteophytes, and you know all those kind of you know features. The other one is actually you know uh, erosive arthritis because uh, because of the central erosions there. Okay. So these are. This is how you would tell them apart and then diagnose them as, as such. Okay. So these ones, I'll send them obviously. You're going to sort of uh, read them in your leisure time and so that you get familiar with, the, with these ones. Okay. This is rheumatoid arthritis. Quite debilitating, actually. This is psoriatic arthritis. Okay. I'll give you these ones. I'm going to sort of uh, revise them in your own time. Notice here that you know the other feature that you can see here is the is the, um, the the shoulder. What we have here is that there is actually uh, osteophytosis, subarticular sub oh, Come on, what, what are we doing here? Sorry about that. Subarticular sclerosis, osteophytes, and there is actually narrowing. Oh God, narrowing of the subacromial space here. Remember also this, that, you know, there are 
in the subacromial space over here, we have the rotator cuff. Rotator cuff is actually made up of four tendons or muscles, the supraspinatus, infraspinatus, uh, teres minor, and the subscapularis. So in the event that the, there is loss of the subacromial space here, this patient has got a full thickness rotator cuff tear. So this patient obviously might need some kind of decompression you know, to be done or some kind of you know, repair of the shoulder. So this is a severe form of osteoarthritis because we have got the osteophytes over here, osteophytes over there, subarticular sclerosis here, and lots of joint space. It is only osteoarthritis that produces new bone. So this is actually a form of severe um, osteoarthritis. Okay. This is how the, this arthritis, you know, uh, tends to sort of destroy, you know, somebody's, uh, you know, uh, hand and stuff. CPPD is just the uh, calcification uh, of the uh, hyaline cartilage in the in the joint, particularly in the in the in the knees. You may see CPPD or chondrocalcinosis, you know, in the uh, in the knees, in the hips. You may see CPPD in the shoulder. So uh, CPPD is just a linear. Oh, come on! Just a linear calcification of the hyaline cartilage in the joint space itself. So this is CPPD or some books will call it you know, chondrocalcinosis. Quite painful. Some books will call it pseudo, uh, pseudo, uh, pseudo gout. That's chondrocalcinosis. Some people call it you know, CPPD. It's a very, very common feature here. So we can see that you know, the tibia femoral joint space in the lateral compartment, we can see that so it's very thin, very thin, you know, um, uh, very thin uh, linear calcification of the hyaline cartilage and possibly very, very faint one in the medial tibia femoral joint space. This is what is called, you know, CPPD or chondrocalcinosis with OA changes. Look at this. CPPD, we can see it quite common in the metacarpophalangeal joint of the index and uh, uh, middle fingers in the in the hand and the fibrocartilage complex in the in the wrist. So these are uh, uh, features, you know, of chondrocalcinosis. Notice also that this patient may have a component of rheumatoid arthritis because of the ligamentous laxity going on here. Notice also that this patient has got a bone demineralization. There is joint space narrowing of the metacarpophalangeal joints. There is soft tissue swelling at the metacarpophalangeal joints of all digits here with a bit of you know, periarticular erosion involving the fourth metacarpal. So this patient has got a CPPD with the underlying features of rheumatoid arthritis and a component of osteoarthritis involving the distal interphalangeal joint. So a patient could have a, a, a combo of all these features, right? So we can see that you no, know, uh, this is what we are seeing here. Okay. We can see the intraosseous cyst here, intraosseous cyst over here, and the erosion of the distal or articular surface of the radius. Chondrocalcinosis, we can see a very thin calcification uh, of the hyaline cartilage in the in the hip we can also see chondrocalcinosis also in the in the shoulder here so that's the distribution of chondrocalcinosis or cppd you would find them in those joints this is gout gout is actually quite common in men than women uh, women before menopause women cannot actually be diagnosed with gout. A postmenopausal woman, yes, you can see gout, but this is a gentleman's disease. And the people that like red meat a lot, you know, they tend to actually have uh, gout attacks and things like that. So what are the features of gout? 
So we've got uric, uric deposits in the soft tissues, particularly of the first metatarsophalangeal joint. So we have a, a uric deposits here, uric deposits in the skin. There's soft tissue swelling with increased soft tissue density, predominantly involving the, 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 the hallux. And then you tend to have what is called the uh, punched out erosions with the overhanging margins. If this is a male patient, you are definitely right to actually diagnose this patient to have gout. So gout will appear that way. It will have you know, calcified tophus, you know, which is actually uric deposit, the soft tissues, particularly of the hallux. And then you'd have um, uh, the bones will be normal in, in, in density, but you will also have punched out lesions you know, with the sclerotic margins or um, uh, overhanging edges. So that is gout. Notice that we've got, you know, patched out lesions here and the soft tissue swelling around it with uric deposits, normal bone mineralization. These are features of gout. Remember, a woman before menopause can never have gout. So these are the features of gout that you can see over there, quite destructive. That's gout. That is gout. You can see it, you know, and that's the distribution of gout. But usually it will be the first, the big toe that is usually, you know, um, found. And then these are the common sites and the distribution of gout, you know, particularly in men. But women above, let's say, 60, 70, 80 years, the ratio of gout to men is possibly one to one. But before that, it will be, you know, maybe four to one, you know. Okay. So that's what we have. Okay. We spoke about this x ray. We spoke that's gout. We can see a gouty tophus here and another gout tophus, you know, on the, on the hind foot. This is how it looks like, soft tissue swelling, increased, increased the soft tissue density, you know, around the first couple metacarpal joints, you know, there's a punched out lesion here with overhanging edges. This is gout, tophus, you know, patient with gout. Notice also that the head of the first metatarsal, second metatarsal here is flat, possibly with a component of a vascular necrosis called Freiburg's infraction, okay? So the AVN that affects the, sec the head of the second metatarsal is called uh, a Freiburg's infraction or uh, AVN. It's quite common, okay? So this is uh, uh, HADD, it's just a calcific, tendinopathy involving the uh, calcific, calcific deposits that are found in the supraspinatus tendon attaching to the greater tuberosity. So this is HADD, or some people will just call it, you know, a calcific density, you know, within the uh, contours of the supraspinatus tendon. Quite common to see that. Again, we can see that you know, there's calcific deposits, you know, involving the, uh, the uh, rotator calf. So if this is the humerus, this is the, uh, if this is the humerus, this is the humeral, uh, the, the joint space itself, glenoid, this is how it should be. But uh, once you start, you know, having, you know, uh, joint space narrowing, particularly at the acromiohumeral interval, you, 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 you are now going to start having problems with the um, um, uh, um, rotator calf. So there is, with the rotator calf issues, you have got the acromion here, you've got the humeral head here, and you've got the, the scapula and the glenoid here. What has happened here is that because of the ligamentous laxity, there is proximal migration of the humeral head with the narrowing of the subacromial space here, which is keeping more pressure on the um, rotator calf. 
So this patient here might need, you know, might need decompression of the rotator cuff. So you'll find that those are, you know, the surgeons are going to sort of, uh, you know, operate on these patients to give them a bit of uh, space, you know, uh, for them to, well, this is very painful really, to be honest. So patients, when they come in, do a proper shoulder x-ray, you know, with no rotations at all. And then you're going to see, you know, anything, you know, that resembles that. Look at this patient here. We, we do have a superior migration of the humeral head with what is called acetabilization and defemoralization. Acetabilization of the inferior aspect of the acromion with femoralization of the humeral head, narrowing of the subacromial space, putting more pressure on the uh, subacromial space. So this patient's got you know, a full thickness, rotator cuff, you know, uh, uh, degeneration. Notice also that you know, the glenohumeral joint is gone secondary to severe osteoarthritis. Why do I say so? It's because of joint space narrowing, which is quite asymmetrical. Subparticular sclerosis, we've got osteophytes also surrounding the head of the humerus. So this is a patient with a severe OA in the shoulder with features of, uh, features of uh, rotator cuff issues, same as this patient here. I'm trying to rush because I think my time is up, but say uh, uh, this is no more, but we, we are able to see that there's a bit of sclerosis or degenerative changes going over to the uh, greater tuberosity, putting more pressure on the rotator calf issues. So these, uh, you're going to read this in your own time. We can see that uh, uh, in this patient, those are just calcific deposits, you know, in the gluteus uh, region involving the um, maximus and minimus, you know, um, 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 tendons over there. Um, let me just rush to see what I can talk about this one here. This is actually severe OA changes in the, in the neck. We can see osteophytes, uh, intervertebral disc space narrowing, and the end plate and facet joint sclerosis, quite common in the, in the neck. I just want to maybe talk about, uh, you're going to read that. This is ankylosing spondylitis. So we can see in the ankylosing spondylitis, there is a squaring of the vertebrae. One, two, there is actually a loss of bone density. And then there is actually a thin, uh, a thin ossification along the uh, anterior li longitudinal ligament, you know? And then there is ankylosis of the uh, posterior elements, which we may see on the AP as the dagger sign, okay? So these are what we call the shiny corners or some books will call them the uh, Romanus vertebra, Romanus, Romanus lesions. There'll be very, very shiny corners here in, 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 in um, um, ankylosing spondylitis. On the right here, this is what is called dish. I'm not going to go into that, but otherwise you, we will come and talk about that later. Uh, okay, sorry about that. I just want to rush and t tell you something that possibly you might, you might say, yes, okay. Otherwise, you know, I was just rushing through these. Uh, if I thought there's any question, I'm, I'm, I'm happy to take those questions because I think the chairman wanted me to finish at eight o'clock. Otherwise I've overshot by about 15 minutes, which I apologize. If, if I thought there's any question, I'm very happy to take those questions. Any questions? Uh, good evening, sir. Good evening, sir. Thank you so much. Uh, this is quite a comprehensive presentation. We we always appreciate and get a lot of insights from you. Thank you. We, we appreciate. Uh, I'm Cuthbert. Um, I just want you to, to comment on some few things. 